Thanks, Andre. Appreciate that. Sure, I'm in the spotlights, in the headlights here. Good morning. It's lovely to be here. And uh, um, yeah, we also do the streaming thing, and so welcome on every, with everybody online. It's great to have you with us. But um, I like the setup, I must admit. It's uh, clear boundaries. I was given clear boundaries, always healthy, so that I can not move more than X number of centimeters. In any case, no, thanks guys, that's great, it's a lovely just being here with you guys. Um, yeah, I'm married to Erna, and we have three children. Sure, they are growing up. Uh, a lot of people that haven't seen them during the lockdown, um, when they saw them recently, they were like, what? You know, they're just stretching out. Ab Abigail's already wearing the same shoe size as Erna. It's a bit scary, she's only nine. But um, <coughs> David is seven and Emily is four. Um, the other day, they, they, they keep on reminding me that there's a, the hole, there's a hole in my hair. Yeah. And then they ask me about that. And, um, and uh, we came up, they came up with an interesting um, theory the other day. I was uh, just telling a story of when David was quite small. He was maybe a couple of months. Just that... that age where they're really busy, not walking yet, crawling really fast. You know, you know when you hold the baby and then you want to put them on the floor and as you put them down, their, their arms and legs already start moving because they just want to go. And uh, we were very brave parents. We went to a restaurant and, um, and that kind of thing happened. He was all over the place. So I thought, let's just, let's just rein him in a bit. I'm going to put him on my shoulders and you, we'll enjoy our time together, I can have my meal, everything is fine. But then suddenly his tummy wasn't so lucky, you know. And then he deposited some of his um, meals from early in the day, yeah. So then David was like, maybe that's it. Maybe that's, that's why there's a problem, yeah. Anyway. Maybe that's it. I, I was trying to explain the genetics behind it as well, but anyways. Hallelujah. Let's pray for the word. Hallelujah. Father, we're so thankful for your presence. And we're so thankful, Lord, for your word this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would truly lead us into your truth. And the Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. And we, we thank you, Lord, that you are the one that is our teacher, Lord, and that you would lead us into your truth this morning. Let your kingdom come in our hearts, um, and through our lives this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great stuff. I mustn't distract myself. Okay, um, Okay. so I want us to read a bit from Second Samuel, but before we do that, um, you know, I, I actually, just a, bit of, just a bit of context briefly. So, um, just at the end of the, just when Samuel was just about, he wasn't yet a prophet in the nation. He was, Eli was the high priest, was still in charge. They didn't have kings yet. He was, Eli was kind of the, the judge of the day. And uh, things went completely pear-shaped. Go and read it. It's not great. And they, in desperation, they, in, their, in their battle against the Philistines, the Israelites decided they want to bring the Ark of the Covenant onto the battlefield to help them, and then things just got worse from there. And that the, the Ark of the Covenant, which was where the presence of the Lord dwelt, ended up in the hands of the Philistines. And, um, and it was actually there for about 40 years, basically the whole reign of Saul, and just, and just into the reign of, of David as well. And, um, but, uh, you yeah, know, I... I, I Please go and read it. It's just amazing because wherever they put the ark, firstly they put the ark with their gods in their temple, right? Dagon and all kinds of things. And every time in the morning they came, their Dagon was on his face before the ark. <laughs> and they were like, what's going on? Was there like a wind? <laughs> and then they fixed the, the statue and the next morning, bah, head off, completely smashed. No way they can fix that. And they said, this, like, there's something going on. Anyways, and as they, they realized there's something with this ark, and then they, got, they wanted to just get rid of it. 
But um, years, years down the line, we see King David realizing we need to get this ark back to Jerusalem. And uh, he's very sincere in his effort, but he makes a terrible mistake. And, and, and actually, that was uncommon for David because in most of his life, he was the one that was inquiring of the Lord, right? Where Saul was mostly in his, in his um, motives, was sincere, look, maybe this will bless God, or I'm going to try this way to serve God, or I'm going to do my best to you know, bless God in this way, but he never asked God. <laughs> Uh, where David actually, you know, it's kind of, maybe this is the place where he learned this lesson, saying, you know, I need to inquire of the Lord. But he made a mistake, and as they were transporting the, the ark, they brought the ark on a, on a cart, drawn by oxen. And right from the start, actually, if you read way back when they started with the old ark thing, the Lord clearly said that the ark should be carried by humans. Um, in a very specific way, the presence of the Lord is meant to be carried by humans. Amen? Not by me, machines or animals or carts or stuff like that. And uh, we'll get back to that later. So the presence of God was meant to be carried by humans. And they, they had it on a cart. You know the story. The oxen stumbled. The ox was about to come off the, um, the cart. And Uzzah thought again, motive was good, he thought, let me just help out God here, and he was struck dead, dead right there. Crazy moment, David is disillusioned, what's going on, trying to do the right thing here. Um, they stopped, there was about 30,000 guys there, or was it, yeah, a lot of people came rejoicing, bringing the ark, so obviously massive drama, and they stopped the whole procession, and now they had a big problem. And, uh, and then they found this guy, Obed-Edom. Anybody heard of him? Not very well known in Scripture. They just, I don't know how they came. Maybe his house was there. Maybe it was just bad luck for him because he, he was there. The guy's dead. Now they want to put the ark in his house. I mean, how do you explain that to your wife? There's this box, somebody touched it, they died. But don't worry, we're going to put it in our house for a couple of months, sorted. But jokes aside, um, somehow, some, say, some scholars say that he was, he was descended from the Levites, so he was a Levite, so that's why David chose to put uh, Ark there. Some people believe that he wasn't even a Jew, but I'm, I'm leaning more towards the Levite side. But... Um, what if, in whichever way it happened, I, I suspect David just said, you over there, is this your house? We're going to put the ark here. And what a massive commitment, what a massive challenge. But let's just read that first bit there from Second Samuel, and uh, from verse, chapter 6, from verse 9. David was afraid of the Lord that day after what happened, um, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told to the king, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And uh, so just a bunch of things I want to say here. But firstly, that blessing that happened there, just before we go on it, it was visible. It wasn't a, one of those invisible blessings like the peace of the Lord, or, which was probably also there. But it was so visible that people went and told the king about it. This three-month transformation of blessing on this house, on this family, on everything they owned, everything they were about, were blessed to such an extent that people said, listen, we need, we need to go tell King David about this. Okay? And, um, but let's just try and put ourselves on their shoes for a moment. So he's, he's not well known before this in Scripture, no, no mention. Um, and 
but by the grace of the Lord, maybe he didn't have a choice, but by the grace of God, he, he, they, they ended up with the ark in their, their home. They couldn't have been a very wealthy man, um, so probably not a massive house. He did have a lot of sons, I think about eight. I'm going to read about that a bit later. But so lots of kids, not a lot of space, now this ark. Okay, massive disruption. Can you imagine? I'm trying to think this that place we had and when we were living in England, 70 squares, three kids. I don't even have eight kids. Imagine putting a, a room aside for the ark. Anyway, the point is massive disruption. It's, you know, half your house is taken up maybe. They can't touch the ark. Clearly, they've not, noticed that now. So obviously fear and, you know, massive sacrifice happening here. Um, but somehow they still managed, they managed to honor God in it. And they managed to not make the mistake of the other guys, and they actually managed to honor God. Um, and he must have been a man of faith to actually agree. But um, it's, it's incredible when we, when we, often when we get an opportunity to serve, or when we get an opportunity, when, or when the Lord lays something on our hearts, or when we are we're convicted by something, isn't that often that we make these kind of sums? And I was so ple- just blessed by the word shared this morning. You know, sometimes even when we're most overwhelmed, the Lord convicts us of something, and then we're like, "But God, what? I, I, I don't have time, and my schedule's crazy. I've, I've my resources all so stretched already, and I'm, you just feel oh, this is going to just disrupt the whole family life. We just come into a rhythm." Parents will know what that means. We've just come into some rhythm of sanity, you know, like getting four hours of sleep a night at, le- at last, you know. Um, and, then, and then something like that comes up. And, immediately, and, and often we come, to, we come to that point where we feel, oh, this is such a burden. I can't handle this. This is too much. I, and I, I was just challenged again last week. A friend of mine shared what, what he was wrestling through, and he says that, you know, we feel, I've only got this much in my cup. I can't give that as well. And, and he was saying, maybe that's a word for somebody this morning, he was saying that we need to trust God again. Not only that he's the provider, but he's also the replenisher. Amen? Not only the one provides an abundance, but that what he gives us, that we can do with that, with boldness, what he leads us to do, knowing that he will also replenish that which he, which, which we had to sow. Um, so we think around those lines, you know, do I have capacity? Do I have, you know, do I have room on my plate for this? Um, you know, so oftentimes, especially initially, it feels like this thing that God is putting on my heart is actually going to be a burden. It feels like a burden. It feels like a chore. It feels like a uh, thing weighing me down, even stuff like you know coming out of a f- weird season like this, and now I'm having to make time for, you know to see people to get around to a small group again, stuff like that it, even stuff like that may feel like this is just is challenging for me, depending on your life phase or where you're at, it might be more so or less so um, and I find that <clears throat> often this this happens now. This has happened in my life, and pastor's not supposed to say that, okay? But I've experienced this, where, that, where it becomes a burden, where it becomes a heavy thing to do what God has called you to do, and where it feels like you're so overwhelmed that the thing that you love the most, the doing God's will and preaching the gospel, suddenly feels like a, a, a chore and no longer a privilege. You know, it's, it starts to feel like this, I don't have capacity, I can't. <laughs> and uh, and I've, I've found that often this happens um, when we start finding our fulfillment in creation rather than the creator. When we, and this is not a conscious decision, this is just a, I'm so overwhelmed with life and we are work or babies or whatever it is that I'm, I'm just clutching at straws. I'm just trying to make it through the day. Um, whatever, you know, fill in the blank there. And then we start trying to find our strength and our fulfillment in something that is created and not 
the one that that is our source. Somebody said it the other way so well. They said that um, that creation is meant to be a blessing. So the things around us and God, what God has created, is meant to be a blessing to us. But it's like a like a pudding, like a treat. You can't eat that all the time. <laughs> that can't that can't be your main sustenance. The, in Him we find our main sustenance. He's the main meal. Amen. Yes, it's great to have a dessert here and there. I'm trying to explain this to Abby now because she she loves reading so much. We're so thankful because that's really going to be a blessing for her school and study career. She loves reading, so she reads like a book a day, and she just loves it. And, and I'm trying to explain to her as a nine-year-old that you can't have pudding all day. You've got to have something of sustenance, you know. You got to eat the word as well, you know. Have you, and I ask her, have you fed your spirit today? How's your spirit doing? How's your spirit hungry? And I, I hope, you know, she's getting that. In any case, so often when we come to that place of being overwhelmed, it's because of that we are starting to find, or we not even thinking about it, we're trying to find our strength and our sustenance and our fulfillment somewhere else, except in the actual um, Creator and, and God Himself. I had such a great conversation with uh, somebody in our church the other day. Amazing guy. He, he was involved on every level that you can imagine. He was a leader in church. He was a missions leader, ministry leader, really anointed guy, uh, passionate about Jesus. Got married and still very involved. First child, second child. And I was like, and then, and I could see they're going through a rough time. He had to work far. He had to drive all over the country. It was a tough season. He wasn't involved. And he came to me the other day, and he was telling me this exact thing. He said, he, there was this, they were so overwhelmed with life that they realized that everything that's from God seemed like a burden. And everything that seemed godly or everything that seemed like a kingdom thing seemed like a heavy chore or burden. And with the conclusion they came to, which blessed me so much, is they said, we realize we need to get back to the feet of Jesus. We need to get back into his presence. We need to make sure that among, in this crazy season that we're in, that we make room for the ark in our chaos. We need room for his presence. We make room in our hectic schedule so that we are able to find our sustenance in him again. I mean, that encouraged me so much. Because I thought, to be honest, I thought when he asked me for a meeting, I thought he's going to say he's moving on, moving to a different church. <laughs> because, you know, he had some offenses also that he had to work through. And uh, anyway, we have those difficult conversations sometimes. Maybe he's watching this right now. Any case, but um, um, I was so blessed. Because somebody that's worked through those difficult things and that has come to this conclusion is in a good space. Um, okay, let's go on. So the ark, um, and we've touched on this, the ark was where the presence of the Lord dwelt. How's the time on that day? Is it, I, I haven't even seen when I started. So it was where the presence of the Lord dwelt. That's where um, inside, actually, there were the Ten Commandments. There was Mos um, Aaron's rod. Um, and then it, there, were also, there was also some manna. And... Uh, so the ark represented not only the presence of God, but very powerfully also the, the word, his law. Um, and, if, and for us to start making, how, how do we start making room for that word and the law of the Lord and his statutes in our lives? Um, for, a, for, you know, for a young family, for us, to be honest, it's, it's really <laughs> tricky sometimes. Um, I sometimes feel like the Lord blesses us, our family, in spite of us, parents. <laughs> yeah, you know, we get stuff wrong, we, we, we miss it, we're very human, and, um, but we found those times in the Word are so precious. Just recently, uh, just before we turned seven, David, we were doing reading about Pentecost. Long story short, he says, this sounds great, let's pray, and he received tongues, he was praying in tongues, and uh, I didn't rea realize it at first, only the next morning he said to me, 
he's sure the Lord has given him his special language. I said, really? I said, yes. I said, go for it. I said, no, he just does it softly. But I've, I've, we've prayed enough now that he's, you know, he's praying a bit loud. He tells me he practices at school as well. I said, okay, that's, that's interesting. He says, but only softly. I said, okay, okay go for it. But uh, what, I've, what has blessed me is that since he's been filled with the Spirit, his interaction with the Word has just changed completely. He's just, his discernment and his, his ability to, to receive something from the Word has just gone to a completely next level. So I'm, I'm always, when we read, I'm like, what is he going to say next? You know, because the Holy Spirit really speaks to them. Any case, so that time in the Word. The secondly, the manner speaks of God's love and, and specifically His miraculous provision. When we make room for the presence of God, we make room again to walk in His love and to walk in His provision. Amen. And then it speaks also the, the the rod, which was Aaron's rod that budded. Go and read about that. It's quite cool. It speaks of uh, God's direction, His leading, but also His protection. And uh, and I think that's often what we miss is that it feels like a burden, but then the blessings and the presence of God and what comes along with positioning ourselves in His purpose outweigh the sacrifice like you cannot even explain it. You know, it's, it's just, um, um, it's, it's a complete, you can't believe that it felt like a chore before because now you realize that God's just blessing and His, his, uh, his uh, presence and his, 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 even, in, you know, as I said, in the children's lives, there's so much life that's coming. And that's not saying it's always easy. I'm not saying it's, it's just, and everything is amazing from that point forward. But I am saying that you, we, we st- you start to notice, as Obed Eden did, there's a blessing here because of the presence of God. There's a blessing. So I want to encourage those families, start somewhere, trust God, um, and you, you'll see the fruit. The other day, Abigail... We said we normally pray for friends at school or somebody in the, our street that needs to be saved. And that night I, I, I felt, let's ask the Holy Spirit, what shall we pray for? And obviously Emily is like rolling her eyes, looking at his four, you know, so she's not, she's, she has these amazing thoughts about prayer. But um, uh, she's so sensitive to the presence of God, it's amazing. But, but Abby pipes up, she says, she feels we need to pray for that family at Live Village with the two, with the twin black boys, the, you know, the Blich notes. And uh, we, so we don't see them a lot and we don't speak to them a lot, but we, and George and them, but she pipes up, we must pray for them. I said, great, let's do it. So we pray and afterwards I send John George a message. I said, listen, God's led us to pray. And he was so thankful. He said, this, this has been a rough two weeks and it just gave us some context. And I was so encouraged to be able to tell Abby, you know what? Um, God has spoken to you. This is because she always says, "No, God never speaks to me." You know. In uh, any case, but um, so as we as we pursue Him and as we position ourselves around the presence of God, the, the blessing is amazing. Let's let's just recap from the life of Obed Edom. So they say the blessing was so visible that they went to tell the king, and he just decided, "This is it. I want to get that blessing," and he went to fetch the ark. But let's go a bit further and, and chronic, or back in, uh, in Chronicles 26, 1 Chronicles. I just want to quickly read a bit about the legacy that came from this. Four sons of Obed-Edom, from verse 4, also gatekeepers were Shemaiah, the oldest, Jehoshaphat, the second, Joah, the third, Sakar, the fourth, Nathanael, um, the, six, the fifth, Amiel, the sixth, Issachar, the seventh, and this guy with the great name, the eighth. Um, and then he said, God had richly blessed Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom's son, Shemaiah, had sons with great ability who earned positions of great authority in the clan. Their names were Otni, Raphael, Obed, and El- Elzabad. Their relatives, Elihu and Samachiah, were also very capable men. All of these descendants of Obed-Edom, including their sons and their grandsons, 62 of them all, were capable men, well qualified for their work. Can you see how this generational 
blessing was kind of starting to get momentum because of one guy's decision or because of the grace of God. And for those three months, their lives were never the same again. Three months. But, but after these three months, Obed-Edom had a choice. Because now David said, okay, we're doing this right, and they got the ark, and off they went. But their lives were impacted to such an extent that he said, there's no way I'm letting that thing go out of my sight. And he became a doorkeeper in the temple. He said, I'm going to stick with the presence of the Lord. He's, the impact on their family was such that he, they packed up everything and they moved and he became a doorkeeper in the house of God. Isn't that amazing? Later on there's an Obed-Edom that's mentioned among the musicians. I'm not sure if it's the same one but it's possible that he was even, he became a worship leader. So he grew in ministry, he grew in, in his faithfulness but he made a key decision that I have experienced the blessing and the power of God to such an extent that I cannot go without it anymore. You know what was possible? It, was, it would have been possible for him to say, to live off that three months powerful experience for the rest of his life. And I've seen that happen. We have encounters with God, and we're so blessed with that encounter that we, we live on the momentum and we live on that encounter for long periods without really pressing into God again. But he said, no ways. I'm not going to just you know, live on the, the bits that I still remember and the blessing. Although it was huge. But he positioned himself and his family. And he said, we're going to keep on following what God has called us to do. We're going to keep on, even if it means packing up a family of ten. Hallelujah. I can't even imagine that. You know, packing up a big family and pursuing the purposes of God, making sure we position ourselves around the presence of God, around His purpose, around His will, um, around what He has called us to do. So there is a cost. There is a sacrifice. But Obed, you didn't made the sums, and he reckons this is a good deal. I'm going to go for it. Oh, whatever the sacrifice, whatever the cost, he realized he, he, this is something he needs to do. Amen. Psalm 84, 9 to 12, it says, For a day in your court is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will, will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. It could have been written by him, hey? Even you know, being a doorkeeper is better than being s somewhere else. And I want to... I don't think I skipped the scripture. In any case, so Psalm 16, 5 to 11. Anyway, let's read Psalm 16. The Lord is, is the portion of my inheritance, my cup. This is the Amplified. He is all I need. You support my lot. The boundary lines of the land have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, my, in in my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my heart, mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my, my heart is glad and my glory, my innermost self rejoices. My body too will dwell confidently in safety. For you will not abandon me to Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. As we pursue his kingdom, I, I just have such a heart this morning. I'm, th I'm so thankful for those words. But I have such a conviction that there might be some that are listening to this message this morning and, and you are maybe at that place of, I'm struggling to breathe because there's just so much stuff happening and 
overwhelmed by whatever it is, or maybe the phase of life that you're in, or maybe you're going through a change in phase of life. Those can be traumatic. I just feel God wants to reach out to you this morning and, and grab you by the hand and allow you to lift your head and recognize what he's putting, holding before you. You know, often when we feel so weighed down, it's because we have a wrong yoke weighing us down. When it's a yoke that's not of God, often we, we try to get something, manage something, or which is not of God. And we struggle so hard, and it's so heavy, and it's so difficult. So he invites us again this morning, I believe, to say, he's going, come and yoke with me and learn from me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And then he says, when you yoke with me, he says, you will have rest for your souls. And it's, if we don't yoke with him, and if we're carrying a different yoke, there's no rest for our souls. Somebody challenged me the other day, uh, Pastor Heinrich actually, uh, he was saying that sometimes if you're in a good space, if this is, it makes sense, if, you, if you're strong, if you're nourished, and if you're encouraged, and if you're finding your source in Christ, then you are able to carry a different kind of yoke. So that sometimes is the challenge is that we, we're not in a good space, and we're not strong in the Lord, and we're not you know, finding our strength in Him, and then we struggle even with the yoke that, that is from Him. But again, the invitation is to come to Him and to, to sit at His feet. And if you're a mom um, with small babies this morning and you feel oh, there's no time for that, I fall asleep when I, you know, when I, I mean, that, that season of small babies and that, that challenging, those challenging teens, maybe a child that's ill, I felt the Lord saying that even just choosing again, to look to Him. Even just saying, Lord, even, even though I've just got seconds in a day or minutes, or I, I just feel that Lord is holding that invitation before us to say, just choose again to find your strength in me, to find your sustenance in me. Let's stand this morning. I want us to pray briefly. <coughs> Feel there, and maybe some here this morning, maybe some listening online, and maybe you in that place where you have been relying on your past experience with God to keep you going. Maybe you've had a great, you have great encounters with God. You've you've seen God do amazing things in your life. I just feel that there may be some here that are that God is inviting you to position yourself again to make room for the ark. To, like obed Edom had to pack up his stuff and move. Maybe that's not the case for you, but, but to, choose, to choose again to come and sit at his feet. To choose again to, to know, to recognize the blessing and to recognize His hand on your life. You choose again to yoke with Him. Find rest. Find our sustenance in Him again. Find our fulfillment in Him again. Find our peace in Him again. Our strength to allow Him to lift us up. Let's close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, that you've opened a new and living way for us to come into your presence, for us.
us to have communion with you, for us to have real, intimate, day-to-day encounters with you, relationship with you, Lord. We are so thankful for the cross. Father, thank you that you love each one listening to this message, Lord. Thank you that your heart is for them, is to know them, Lord, and to, for them to flourish in what you've called them to do, Lord, for them to grow closer to, to you, God. And thank you again that there's the, the invitation from you this morning to draw near to you. As every eye is closed, I just sense also that God is inviting if you, if you feel far from Him this morning, if you know for sure even that you don't have a relationship with God, if you, if you know right now that you are not right with God, He is inviting you to come to Him. And He is holding before you the greatest thing has ever happened in the history of the world. He said, I've given my Son in your place to pay for your sin and to carry the price on His life, to carry the the cost of your sin and your shame and your guilt and your pain. Everything that's withholding you from a relationship with me, God says that Christ has paid and has carried that on the cross. So there's an invitation this morning to come to Him, to take up your cross, to follow Him, to repent of your sins, to turn away from your life, but to follow Him and His life. And if that's you this morning and you have that desire, as every eye is closed, I'd like you to just raise your hand briefly and then I can pray with you. Is there anybody like that? You want to commit to following Christ today? I'd love to pray with you. Hallelujah. And then if you if you this morning and you have been relying on past experience and if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you if there's things around following Christ that are burdensome, that are heavy at the moment, I just feel the Holy Spirit is inviting us to just lay those things at His feet and to, to just look to Him again. I sense some of the yokes are from God, but, but we're not finding our strength in Him, so we are struggling. So just where you're standing, why don't you just bring those things before the Lord and just just where you're at, just where you're standing in your own voice, just say, Lord, I just commit this to you again. I choose to come and find my strength in you again, Lord. I, some I feel need to repent that, that you've not pursued his presence as you did in the past. Some need to repent of, of um, not bringing these things before, before the Lord sooner and kind of trying so hard, striving and working hard, trying finding our sustenance in, in the creation. I just sense there's such a grace this morning just to bring that to Him right now. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you that you destroy every yoke of bondage in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you do destroy every yoke of striving and fear in the name of Jesus. I sense the fear of man on some lives, Lord. This fear and this anxiety around work in the name of Jesus. We, we cast that down. We break the hold of fear. In the name of Jesus, I sense some have experienced anxiety attacks even this week, or struggling to breathe. In the name of Jesus, we command that the yoke of fear to lift off your life right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that surpasses understanding in the name of Jesus that will guard our hearts and minds right now in Jesus' name. I sense some hearts God is stirring just to, to choose to look to Him again. Say, Lord, You are all I need. I'll find my strength in You alone. I seek Your kingdom first, as we sang earlier. Everything else will be added as I make room for the ark in my life. Everything else will be added. 
Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we ask that you would continue to stir our hearts, even in this week. And I thank you for grace that we would open our homes again, open our schedules again, open our lives again. Say, come, come, Lord Jesus. Let your kingdom come first. Let your glory come. I speak your blessing, Lord, over every family here, over every parent specifically, Lord, every person that's wrestling with the realities of life, God, and every, may I sense somehow struggling with work things in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are the lifter of our heads today. I thank you, Lord, that you invite us to come and sit with you and yoke with you and rest for our souls, God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Even this week, Lord, thank you for good fruit of this word in our lives, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not sure how you guys do the prayer thing at the moment. Um, can people come to the front? Do you want to? Yeah, if you're here this morning and you would like somebody to pray with you, please come forward. We won't lay hands on you. We'll keep a bit of space, but as the band just lead us in another song, I want to encourage you, please come forward. We would love to pray with you. Yaku, really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. like 
mystified May we be just like a child again Staring at the beauty of our King Beauty of May we never lose our wonder Yeah.